All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Eileen McDar. How are you doing, Eileen? Great. <laughs> and Eileen, where are you today? I'm sitting in my office in Dana Point, California. Ah, Dana Point, beautiful part. I'm down in San Diego, so not too far away, actually. Uh, and Eileen is the author of a number of books. Uh, the latest one is Your Resilience GPS, a guide, for, a guide for growing through life and work. And what Eileen and I want to talk about today is this idea of resilience. And, and we were just, before we came on air, we were just discussing this whole notion of burnout. Uh, and it seems, Eileen, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like burnout is becoming more and more of a phenomenon because as we were talking earlier, I don't remember burnout conversations years ago when I was kind of coming up through my career, but it's a big topic nowadays. Uh, it, it absolutely is. I am being asked more and more to go into organizations or to speak at conferences on resiliency, but the framework is help us survive change mm -hmm. and help us with this notion of burnout. I am seeing more and more statistics globally, not just not just nationally, but globally, that people are um, overworked, overwhelmed, which says to me there's something really go going on wrong with ourselves as individuals first. And one of the things that I'm picking up on, John, is that we have we have bought into this strange notion of what success looks like, mm -hmm. and we have translated it into a number right to acquisition and when we do that at the price of who we are we lose something so uh, let me kind of define this resiliency yes, for you please. first because i have i call it radical resiliency because i disagree with the dictionary definition the dictionary definition says that resiliency means to bounce back that's what audience means to go back. Well, that's great if you're a piece of steel that can bend or you're a tree that can come back. But in the human system, there is no such thing as going back. You can never go back. Resiliency is about growing through. It's all about growth. How do I grow through challenge or opportunity? And at the end of the day, resiliency is all about energy management. Do I have the energy to keep on keeping on? And what is energy? At, it, at its basic level is the capacity to do work. So what is it that I, as a leader, am I doing to myself or I'm helping create this organization that is zapping people's energy? Mm -hmm. What is it that I say to myself that zaps that energy? So, so um, let's step back for a moment, to, as you said, this idea of, of success definite. Do you think that most people really define what success means to them? Because, I mean, I think, I think a lot of people don't really have a good idea. They think they know what success means, but they've never really looked at it from their own point of view and said, this is what success looks like to me. That's a, it's an interesting question, John, and I think it's one that is also compounded because of the way we are so digitally connected, mm -hmm. but emotionally disconnected. Absolutely. Our, our, as I always call it, the disconnected, connected world. Uh, it is. And in fact, I'm going to be speaking at an International Coaching Federation conference in Man Manila in November, and that's what I'm suggesting we talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this notion of what is it to be successful is that we, in these little, if I could hold up my phone, I'm looking at the Instagram, I'm looking yep. at the Facebook, oh my God, John went to Ireland yeah. for the summer. Oh, and I'm going to flip hamburgers. What's wrong with me? And so we do this comparison kind of thing. Yes, yes. And that's, I, as I spoke to you earlier before we started the program, I spoke at a university, and that's one of their grave concerns about the students, is that the students are feeling alone, alienated, I'm not successful, but I can, if I hang on long enough and I get that big job, then all will be great. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do first on ourselves. Yeah, and it's very, and it's it is very tough because, as you said, uh, you know, we're very good at so we take these, we see these vignettes and snapshots and of time, you know, in time on Instagram or whatever, and we're all guilty of it because I I love Instagram, I have to say, sorry, but I do, and uh, 
but what we do as people is that we create the whole narrative around this snapshot in time and we build this world and we go, oh my goodness, they're, as you said, well, their life must be fantastic and mine, you know, and mine sucks. So we're, we're, we end up in these making weird comparisons with ourselves, with things that we know nothing about. And I think that gets back to, as you said, starting with yourself, because what are you comparing? Yeah. And some of this will be a, a function of age. Mm-hmm. You know, when we're, when we're young, when we're adolescents, you know, it's all about, you know, going and energy and achievement. And then when you reach a certain point, it's, it's okay, what about this? And then as you reach where there's more of your life behind you than in front of you, now we begin to look a little bit differently at what do I, you know, what do I choose? To, if I choose to do this, what do I choose to leave behind? So I, I think that there are a couple of things that, if, and if we take it from a leadership perspective, mm-hmm. that if I believe that resiliency at the end of the day is energy management, and energy is created by making connections. Think about a power grid. Mm-hmm. If you've got a bad connection, the energy doesn't go across the power grid. A good connection, you get the energy. So first and foremost, for self-leadership, what are the, what are the ways in which I'm connecting with my head? What am I saying to myself? Mm-hmm. Is this true? Do I need to change this? What is it that my heart's telling me? What is it that I do? Is Am I doing things that give me energy or I'm doing things that deplete energy? And some of the things we do will deplete energy. So sure. how do I think back? And then the question as the overall leader is how is it that I am creating good connections with the people whom I have around me so that they in fact feel worthwhile, heard, understood, served. And that's a real talent. And as much as we talk about technology and artificial intelligence and everything, our challenge, I think, coming into 2020 is to develop soft skills. Mm. We can do the robotic stuff over here. But my real thing is how do we create those authentic relationships? Because it's the creativity of the brain. It is the relationship with the customer. It is the relationship with each other. And that's not going to be done because emoticons are not emotion, and email stands for escalation and error. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so how do so here's a, here's what I see as a bit of a challenge, right? Is I agree 100 percent with you. You know, as leaders, we need to do these things, and but we're also dealing with a lot of people today who've been fed a lot of these ideas. You know, like that I should be happy all the time at work. You know, that I should be fulfilled all the time at work. That all these unrealistic expectations, and therefore there's often a disconnect between the leader and the people he's trying to lead because expectations are so out of whack. How do you bridge that gap? Well, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. And actually you, you do it, I think, almost on a one-to-one basis. Mm-hmm. But the work that Daniel Pink has done on motivation, what motivates people, uh, it was fascinating. Uh, and what he came up with was that there are three things. Um, and money is not it. It's autonomy, mastery, and meaning. So autonomy is, help me figure out how to do this by myself. How, how can I do what I do better? So I'm constantly growing. And the last one is, what makes this meaningful? And I can't get meaning from you, my leader. Mm-hmm. I have to say to myself, does what I do matter? Now, sometimes what a leader can do is a leader can tell someone, this is why what you do matter. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, this was long ago and far away. Um, the, a surgeon was entering in one of, one of the hospitals there in San Diego and was heard um, going up to one of the, back then we called them janitors, now they're environmental whatever. Um, <laughs> he, said, he said, John, I'm really glad to see you here. You know, I never worry when I know you're on duty. And do you think that statement meant to that janitor that it was as important the hospital was clean Mm -hmm. as the surgeon's hands were steady on the table. Yeah. So sometimes we're so close to our work. We need someone to step out of us and say, let me tell you why this is meaningful. That's one of the practices I try to do no matter where I am when I say thank you and let me tell you why this was a good job. It's far more powerful than just giving somebody two thumbs up. Yeah. Just an, 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 an emoji of a thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. An emoji of a thumbs up. 
Um, so tell me this, right? The other thing that, uh, so you hear all the time, you know, and, and this is very connected to the burnout thing, but you hear all the time is like everybody says, and we all say, we're so much busier than we've ever been, you know, ever before. And we're like the busiest people in the world's history and all of that. And I often take a step back and say, are we though, are we the busiest people or are we the most distracted people, right? Because we have so much other stuff coming in that if we really separated all that out, we're probably not as busy as we think. But how, so talk to me a little bit about that, that, that kind of distractedness, overwhelmness and burnout piece. You know, one of the things that, um, when I'm lecturing and I have groups together, I ask them to do, first, we substitute the word choose to for have to. Mm -hmm. Choose is one of the most powerful words in the English language. I did not have to talk to you today, John. Yeah. This is my choice. Absolutely. I did not have to walk into some company and do whatever. It's my choice. If I start to say the word choice that says it's in my, I, mm -hmm. I own it. Nobody else owns it. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, how do I know, where does my time go? And I, this is the most tedious thing I ask people to do. And I tell you, if you do it once, you will see such a pattern of where your life goes. And it's to actually keep a little time log. Not a monument in paper mache, but a, literally a piece of paper. And you, for seven full days, from the time you get up to the time you go to bed, what are you doing? Just two words. How much time is it taking? Uh, and where and who? And you're going to begin to see a pattern you will begin to see how much time you spend on this thing. Mm -hmm. You will begin to see what people use your time. You will begin to see how much time you spent over at Starbucks kvitching about something that was wrong. And did, you begin to see where this precious thing called time goes. So, and I agree with you, this notion of, of distraction. You know, we know that we are not capable of multitasking. Yet you have a whole group of people say, I can multitask. Our brains were not created for that. And it takes us as much as 20 minutes to get back on task. Mm -hmm. Like if I were taking calls right now, or if I had my email alert coming in, going blah, blah, blah. I'm not showing up for you. Yep. I'm doing something totally different. Yeah, because let's face it, multitasking really is doing a lot of things really badly. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, all the research is saying, while you think you can do it well, you really don't. Yeah. And so it's, it's, so does it, so we have a number of challenges in, in leadership then. I mean, you have distraction, you have people feeling overwhelmed and overworked. You have this idea that people, you know, want to, you know, feel that they should have meaning or want to find meaning. How do you, how do you, how do you square that circle? I mean, how do you deal with all of these things and run your business at the same time? Well, um, there are two things we talk about. We think about recruitment and we think about retention. Mm -hmm. And when I think about retention in an organization, again, it's going to go back, Don, to what are the conversations that the person who I report to have with me? And some of the questions are related to, first off, not what are you good at, but what are you interested in? Mm -hmm. I can put you someplace where you're interested in it. Because, for example, I'm very, I could write press releases till the cows came home. I'm very good at that. I'm not interested in doing that. So that's one of the questions. Another question is, what could we do? What, what do you need to, if knowing that maybe I can't give you, I can't give you more money. Uh, budget's just not there. And, you know, we're down three people over here. But tell me something that we could do that could help you do what you do in a way that you feel better about it. You know what? There's always an answer. But we're afraid to ask the question. We're yeah. afraid to ask that question. And then I think the other thing from a leadership perspective is how does the leader model what it looks like to live a life of contribution, um, to live a life that supports other people, Mm -hmm. and uh, allows other people the same. Uh, now, I don't know if this is true today, but the last time I looked, the Boston Consulting Group, tell, and it's got, okay, it's got consultants all, all over sure. the place, it said that you are not to answer any company email on the weekend. Put it away. They actually made it one of their practices. There's another company that's in the Bay Area that, that has uh, its phone-free meetings. You put the phone in a box. 
and then you go in because what that does is that keeps us back from that distraction. Yeah. Um, and sometimes we have to force ourselves to do this. No, uh, absolutely. You've got to force yourself to be present. It, you know, it's, um, it's really true. Um, it's not, it's not hard. What it is, is I think we also, and I'll put myself in this, buy into the notion that I am somehow indispensable. And if you can't get me right away, oh my God, I just let you down. <laughs> and I'm, for the last couple of decades, I have allowed, and I use the word allowed, I've allowed myself to choose to go away on a silent retreat at the start of every year, which means this is not with me. It means I don't talk to anybody. I go away and I'm quiet. And I have to tell you, John, the first time I did this, I thought the world was going to crash around my head. Surely my business would disappear. You know, people would, nobody missed me. <laughs> You know, we like to think we're that important, but yeah. what you discover is the people who can also do things for you. You can, you can do that. I, I thought I was the only one who could do this. No, mm -hmm. well, I just released you to do something that you're good at, and it gives me more time to do something that maybe I need to do. So there are all these choice points. Yeah, and I think you hit on a, a well, you hit on a, a, a load of interesting points there. But uh, th there's one of them first is that, um, and we we use the management theory here, um, developed by Friedman Malik. But I mean, one of the things that he he advocates is that you don't spend your time trying to fix people's weaknesses. You focus them on you focus on what they're good at, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 as you know, through we've all been around long enough how much time have we spent in the past or have spent in the past going oh here's your here's your performance appraisal here are the things that you need to work on and you're good at so let's focus all our energy there instead of going you know something maybe you're just not good at those and you're not interested in those let's focus where your strengths are mm -hmm. and and i think if you start at that point that's a great point to start and the other thing that you just mentioned there is about people you know other people being able to do things i think the thing that we always have to learn as leaders is sometimes when you give a task to someone, they're not going to do it exactly the same way you would. <laughs> you know what? That is such a wonderful, because I think sometimes the reason we hang on to stuff is number one, they're not going to do it like I am. Mm -hmm. Number two, they're not going to do it as well as I am. Or the fear, oh, they'll do it better than I yeah. am. Oh my gosh, what are they going to do? And um, I've, I've heard myself say this in the past, um, particularly if I'm, the audience has got some working moms in it and you know, you go home from work and you're still working. They yeah. say, well, I have to do the wash. I said, why do you have to do the wash? Well, he won't separate the colors from the whites. I said, so gray is a color. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. said, where do you pick, where do you, where do you pick your battles? As long as you say it has to be done just one way. Um, we also cut ourselves back then from the potential for innovation. Yes. Potential saying, you know, could we get in ruts? We do things the same old way. You know that because it's the way we've always done it. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. <clears throat> fascinating to me, John, how we as human beings <coughs> can so simply get into a rut. And a rut is, I mean, I'll ask a group, how many of you go to uh, exercise class on a regular basis? Okay. How many of you have your place on the floor? Everyone has their place on the floor. God forbid somebody else should be on your place on the floor. Well, why? But there's a huge comfort in in being in a rut, right? So we always complain and people complain to say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm in a rut. But you're in a rut because it's comfortable. It's comfortable yeah, to be in that some rut. Of those, let's face it, some of those things you need. Yeah. If we're going under a tremendous amount of pressure, it's like we say, what's your comfort food? Mm -hmm. What is it that allows you to re-energize? And it could be part of that thing that you are most... Um, accustomed to one of the things though john and i'm starting this now i started it in january when i took myself away on retreat is uh, it was a fascinating book and the, the one of the notions in there was how do you keep as we grow older and older we get more and more ruts how do you keep your soul alive your energy alive and this is a practice that came from the middle ages apparently it is still as practiced in places of spain and the pyrenees in which the individual on the day of their birth for 12 months. So I'm born on the September 5th. So on the fifth of the month for 12 months, I choose to do something I have never done before. Mm. It's a wonderful practice. Yeah. 
and you realize, I mean, not that they're big things. My January I never done before was that I went to try snowshoeing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. Great idea. My, my February that I've never done before is to sign up and take a Pilates reforma class, which is this medieval looking torture instrument. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, I also went to a, a choir practice for a group that I heard about called Threshold Choir um, to find out more about them. They sing at the bedside of people who are passing the threshold as they are dying. Wow. So I thought was, wow, that's really, I'd like to know more about this. Um, so my March, I've already set it up. I'm going to take a jazzercise class. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so well, that's quite quite the uh, it's quite the running the gamut there of all the different things uh, that yes. you're doing. Yes, yes. You can do. By the way, that is another thing when we talk about resiliency and energy management. This physical body, this is the engine that drives the locomotive. Mm -hmm. We don't take care of this. We don't get seven to eight hours sleep. We are exhausted, and it, you can't catch up on the weekend. So mm -hmm. I'm a big proponent of of taking care of this physical body, our diet, our exercise. Oh yeah, uh, I 100% agree. Um, I, I, I'm fortunate, like, I've been doing martial arts for a long, long time. And, um, <laughs> and for me, it's because I was explaining to somebody recently, I said, I said, it's, I said when, I go, when I go to train at martial arts, I said, I can't think about work. Because if I thought about work, I, somebody kicked me in the face because I wouldn't be focusing, right? Because I wouldn't be focusing. And I said, it's great. And I think everybody needs something that takes them completely out of, you know, where they are and escape it and whatever it is. But, you know, you have an hour, a couple of hours, times a week where your mind is just somewhere completely different. I think that's one of the healthiest things you can do. Oh, it is. And not only that, but that's where a lot of innovation comes from. Mm -hmm. When we take ourselves out, and you just, maybe there's something that's in the back of your head. And it's like, I run, I'm a runner. So I'll, I'll see things and go, oh, wow, that's kind of a lesson there. I did try to take a keto, John, I have to admit. I, I tried it. But you have to be able to roll backwards. And there's no way these feet go over this tush. <laughs> that, didn't, that didn't last very long. But um, going away is a really wonderful practice because you do come back refreshed. And it doesn't have to be an exercise. And I no, it can be anything. Out. They paint. Mm -hmm. They paint. They throw pots. They um, go take a cooking class. They do anything that takes you away because it allows you to regroup. And I think that as we come up against the end of our, our time, um, Eileen, I think that's a, a, as we were talking about, like all of this pressure and all of this, both on leaders and in, I th do you think that ultimately we just all put way too much pressure on ourselves? That we own a lot of this because we pile this pressure on ourselves? Let me ask you the question. What do you think? I think so. I, I, I absolutely, I absolutely think so. I, and, and as you, as we, when we started out talking today, even we talk about, you know, when we pick up our, our phone and we look at Instagram and we, suddenly go, oh my goodness, look what's happening. I mean, that's putting unnecessary pressure on ourselves instead of going, well, good for them. That's nice. I have no idea what else is going. You know, they're sitting by a Ferrari. Did they just buy a Ferrari or are they just happen to be standing beside one? <laughs> well, one of the things that I said when I was with the, at the college was in using the word, I choose to. Mm -hmm. So you say, I choose to look at Instagram, whatever you choose to. Then ask yourself why five times. Why do I choose to do this? Mm -hmm. why? Because at the end of the fifth why, you're either going to come up to something that says, yeah, that makes sense. That's why. Or the other one goes, well, that's really stupid. <laughs> why am I doing that? So the five whys actually makes you dig deeper. So for the client that says, you know, she's in a dysfunctional organization, why are you choosing to stay there? Why? why and when she can come up with i do believe there's still some changes i can make here great go for the choice exactly and i think that's the and and you know i love the fact that you that you focus in on choice because that is i believe that is the most fundamental thing and what people take away from today because people hate choice People hate choice because when you make a choice, you by definition unchoose 
other things. And it's much easier not to make choices. Um, therefore, you have no consequences. Well, let me, no choice is a choice. Well, true. Exactly. And it, but that's my, yeah, exactly. And that's the point is that, but I don't think people often are honest enough to say I'm making the choice of making no choice, if that makes sense, but I'm making the choice. Therefore, where I am today belongs to me. It's true. And remember we said you can't go back. Mm -hmm. I can't undo yesterday. Right. All I have is one of the choices that I make today. Yeah. And listen, this has been fantastic, uh, Eileen. I've really enjoyed it. Um, and hopefully you'll come back and talk because I, I just feel like we could talk a lot more about it. We could, <laughs> yeah. So, um, Eileen, thanks very much. And before we go, uh, if you'd just like to tell people a little bit more about yourself, how they can learn more about you and uh, get in contact with you. Sure. Uh, best way is through my website, which you can either put Eileen Mackdar, and you'll have my name up there, or The Resiliency Group. Both of them will direct you to the same place. I have written seven books. Uh, my clients range anywhere from um, college administrators to the U.S. Armed Forces to global pharmaceuticals to educators, a lot of work in healthcare. Um, and so I wear a couple of hats. My hats are as a, as a keynote speaker and presenter. Um, as I am a master facilitator, I like to take groups away and say, who do you want to be when you grow up? Um, and also as a, as a writer and a lecturer. Um, you can find my books uh, from my website. You can also find them on Amazon. Um, and my Twitter handle is MacDarling, M-A-C Darling, MacDarling, all in word. You can find me on Facebook. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. And anything I can do for the, for the people who are watching and listening, I I'd be happy to oblige. Excellent. This has been fantastic. Well, I'm still trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. But, uh, then, but uh, that's, that's the whole thing, John. We <laughs> can't be many people. Yeah. Not locked into one thing. Oh, I, I do have to tell you, this, this I just got the announcement this last week, and I'm kind of happy about it, so I do have to share this with you. There's Absolutely. a British research firm called Global Gurus, which apparently surveys some 22,000 business people and then they rank the top 30 people in various categories. I just got a notice last week that I am ranked number one in the area of communications. Wow, good for you. Well done, that's fantastic. Well, I'm gonna make sure that we put that up here that uh, I got to talk to the number one, the number one <laughs> ranked person in, in communications. That's fantastic, well done. Thank you, thanks yeah. for asking. Well, I can see why, so uh, good choice. All right. Well, listen, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. Eileen McDowell, it's been absolutely fantastic. And I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.